menagerie let's talk about some movies <laughs> Five and six, so I'm gonna try to make this quick this month. Listen, not every movie has to be Citizen Kane. Sometimes a dumb stoner comedy is just what the doctor ordered, and next Friday definitely has some dumb shit. This time in the suburbs, Ice Cube returns as Craig without Chris Tucker, but thankfully Mike Epps steps it up as the hilarious cousin Day Day. Not as charming as the first, but this is still one of many in the long line of buddy stoner comedies like Cheech and Chong or Harold and Kumar, so they all have their time and place. Crazy that just 12 years after releasing Fuck the Police, Ice Cube writes the ending to this movie where the police saved the day. Anyway, I have a Friday 4 pack on DVD so I figured why not light one up while cleaning my room and start off on a high note. On the surface, American fiction is a comedic satire of racial stereotypes, but also thematically about family and selling out to follow your dreams. Watching Next Friday the day before American Fiction was unintentionally ironic because the lead character, a novelist named Thelonious Monk Ellison, criticizes the value of movies that might perpetuate stereotypes, just like Next Friday. When he finally becomes a bestseller after using AAVE instead of his typically elevated prose of verbose vernacular, he's rightfully pissed. It's like when a struggling musician decides to make a cheesy pop hit and then they become a one-hit wonder. Sure, you finally got the success you've always wanted, but at what cost? The dramedy tone and dynamic is especially encapsulated in the relationship with his brother played by the always wonderful Sterling K. Brown. If you see this man's name in the credits, you know the script's gonna be good. The two have a perfect sibling chemistry that bounces between teasing and melancholia. If you have a chance, this is one of those rare Best Picture nominations that everyone can enjoy. Also go check out the real jazz pianist, Thelonious Monk. Kids, if you were born any time after the first, let's say, Iron Man movie, you can probably skip this one, although you shouldn't. This documentary showcases a single night where over two dozen of the biggest and best musicians from the 60s to the 80s gathered to record a song that not only would be historic, but also humanitarian. And just so, so 80s. They got a group of musicians together to create a song in an effort to fundraise for starving kids in Africa, a surprising bit of humanity in a decade that was the start of the downfall of American society, if you ask me. Highlight, Stevie Wonder showing Bob Dylan how to be Bob Dylan. Low light, not a single mention of cocaine, really? They stood up for 24 hours in the 80s without coke, yeah, okay. Also, Michael Jackson going from shy guy to basically band leader was fascinating. And he, Huey Lewis out of his league trying to keep up with everyone else was pretty funny too. I'm not the biggest fan of most of the musicians, but this was a quick fun watch about a bunch of talented people. Ava DuVernay, director of Selma, created this Netflix documentary about the blatant exploitation of the United States prison system. Thanks to the wording of the 13th Amendment of our Constitution, slavery was abolished unless you've been convicted of a crime, and since that amendment, black people have been disproportionately accused and convicted of crimes. Thus, slavery was essentially just rebranded, and while I summed it up quickly here, the evidence of generational abuse and centuries of systemic oppression are overwhelming. It's kind of silly to rate documentaries, especially as a white guy talking about these subjects, so I'll just say watch it, learn from it, and if you have the ability to help end the prison industrial complex, or at least improve their living conditions, you should try, because we don't need to treat inmates with such barbarism. Especially when so many are in for nonviolent crimes or wrongful convictions. Medieval movies can be very hit or miss. The Green Knight absolutely hits, and I really wish I had seen this one in theaters because the visuals are stunning and the set design feels like play in the best way possible. Silhouettes and colorful lighting adds to the magical realism and really helps build the mythological aspect to the story, and even the more... human aspects? Yeah, we see his sword in the stone getting a little tugged on, so this Arthurian legend isn't for kids. Dev Patel is an excellent leading man and believable as both a badass knight and a lying loner. Even if you're not the biggest fan of the medieval or fantasy genre, this one is like nothing you've ever seen before. I was probably about 21 when I first watched the original cartoon, and I'm not going to point out the differences here because it's pointless, and there's plenty of that online already. What I will say is there are three major problems with the series as a show until itself. One, child actors. Two, child actors on green screen slash LED screens. And three, child actors on green screens reading bad dialogue. Look, not every show can be Stranger Things where almost every kid knocks their roles out of the park, but the actors who portray Sokka and Zuko, obviously being the oldest of the teens, are the most believable in their roles. The others are a little stiff, but at least they got the choreography down. 
The volume LED screens are probably the cheaper option rather than real locations, but when every bit of overexpository dialogue is set against the lifeless blurry backdrop delivered by child actors, it can be tough. Lastly, the writing and the tone. In order to make this a must-watch pop culture hit, Netflix had to age up the tone to get that sweet sweet 18 to 34 expendable income demographic. In doing so, they lose that childlike wonder and playfulness, while also rushing the more serious plotlines. There are some awesome adaptations in the show, like Ko, the face dealer's horrifying character design, and Ken Lung's take on Zhao. I think the bending effects usually look really good, and Dallas Liu as Zuko is the most interesting character, but I'm not sure if the first season will get general audiences to stick around. Since it's been renewed for season 2 and 3, maybe they can give the show a little more time to breathe and shoot on location. The first season managed a wobbly landing with room for improvement, and they have their blueprint for the future. Hopefully they don't screw it up. Thanks for watching this month's Menagerie.